Good afternoon. Welcome to session 5A, Engineering Case Studies. We have three presenters this afternoon. Simon Burrow, Ashkan Hashimi, and Jeff Bird. Our first presenter is Simon Burrow. Simon is a structural engineer for WSP based in Dunedin. He leads a team of structural and geotechnical engineers and technicians. Previously based in Wellington for 13 years when he worked for Clendon Burns and Park, Simon was, was the founding chair of the Otago Structural Group for CSOC. Simon. Thank you, John. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about regenerative practice in structural engineering and how we applied that to the South Indian Library project. Um, as well as being the structural engineer, WSP were also the lead consultant, and I was lucky enough to be the design lead. So we had the architect as our sub-consultant, which is an interesting dynamic that I can highly recommend. <laughs> I think they were quite cognizant that they had to approve their invoice every month. Um, so um, we're still actually developing this design, um, and we've done the fun bit though, which is the co-design. So. That was where um, we had a panel of community team members, and we'll talk about that a bit more soon. So regenerative practice, what is it? So the CLEAR Institute defines it as creating facilities that build capacity in people, communities, and natural systems to allow them to renew and thrive. So to do this, they ha uh, have five guiding principles working in holes, not parts. I think we've all been shoved into our structural engineering box before, but we know that projects go much better when we work collaboratively with a team. Uh, it's also about being of service, so there's a level of humility there as well. Account for uniqueness, so every project is different, as we know. From separate to align with nature, this is an interesting one. We um, try and force nature to do what we want sometimes. And from problems to potential, which all engineers love. So regenerative design is about moving beyond sustainability. So sustainability is great, and it's a big part of it, but it's, so it's about minimisation, whereas regeneration is not about being sort of less bad. It's about trying to create something that will continue to create, which is quite a challenge. <clears throat> it's a way of thinking. So it's not always about repurposing an old, um, an old facility into something fantastic, although it can be. In this case, we've actually got a new build project. Um, we like to think of our buildings as static and generally, I guess, something that decays over time. So the idea that it will continue to evolve is a bit of a challenge. Um, we look to work with nature. And the other thing we're encouraged to do as regenerative practitioners is to consider the largest possible system that the project can, uh, can benefit. So <clears throat> for the library, it's a small... Um, not small, but a, a suburban library. So it is a main library in the middle of town in Dunedin, and this is like a satellite of that. So there's an area that it can influence. But we thought it can actually influence beyond that. And I talked a lot in the co-design about the library being the third place. So you have home as number one, works number two, and libraries number three. So um, a place for people to go to communicate. And in some cases, because this is quite a poor sort of area, um, just to keep warm. Um, as well. So just a bit of background about the project. Uh, so it's, the request for this started uh, in the 80s. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a modern library with um, community facilities as well. The council um, in the interim have put a pop-up in 2017 and they were really keen to do a regenerative co-design which was <coughs> quite ambitious. So just quickly about the building, uh, 10 million I think is the total budget including fees and landscaping. It's a 1,600 square metre uh, new build, single storey, timber and steel framed. This is the site. Um, it's largely on the footprint of an existing building, and we'll get into why that is in a bit later on. And these are the existing buildings. I think the architect said to the client, uh, where does the bulldozer come in when we first looked at these? But the client's initial uh, uh, idea was to actually keep these and repurpose them into a library which was, so we went down a track of trying to make a concept work, and we, got, we, did, we did have something, but um, the issue was, this is about almost 3,000 square metres, so quite a bit more than that you needed, and there was a lot of retrofit work required to 
um, to do that. So it was actually cheaper to build a, a smaller new build. And you can see some of the challenges we have with the existing. It's got 13 <coughs> different roofs. Um, in the middle here, five, six, and nine, we called Shanty Town because some of those are just corrugated iron on rafters. And yeah, there's a mix of different structures there. We've got six different structures of different ages, all uh, not quite um, as strong as we'd like them for earthquake purposes. And so this is a new architectural concept. So as you can see, it's a, um, as well as the library, there's also other facilities as well. We've got maker space and a recording studio was one of the initiatives out of the co-design. It's got this interesting thing they call a living street canopy. Um, basically overhangs the building. And one, one of the things that surprised me out of the co-design was that some people have an issue with like entering a building. They're not, they're not confident, especially government or um, local government buildings, they feel like intimidated to enter them. So <clears throat> what the architects have done, they've created this canopy that's like a soft entry. So you sort of get gradually immersed into the building. There's an atrium, you'll see, um, at the top there to do that as well. Some more elevations. And so our structural concept um, is uh, effectively uh, timber framing. Uh, we've got a glue lamp port portal frames um, along, along a series of grids there, uh, steel purlins in between. And we're using electrical system as a, a ply bracing walls. And we've got, um, we've got a shallow foundation, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. And we've got to hold up this um, canopy at the front. It's just a section through the structure. And so our foundation um, concept is to actually build on top of the, um, on top of the existing slab. And to, um, the reason for that is because for flooding mostly. Um, and we'll get into why this is a really good regenerative um, initiative later on. So the co-design um, was facilitated by a specialist um, from uh, Flatfish Projects. So they had a series of workshops planned. I think there was about eight workshops. Um, but then COVID hit, so we went online. And it was a bit punishing to have a full day workshop online. So we stretched it out over a few more months and um, took a bit longer, but it was a really interesting process. So they, have, they selected 12 community members to be part of this design and Mana Fena are a partner, they're not a stakeholder. Um, yeah, so you can't, I guess, um, co-design, you might think, oh, they're designing a beam for us or air conditioning. No, no, they're not. All, all, all the co-design does is come up with initiatives to include in the building. And so um, this is one thing they came up with uh, was Kaituna. So this is uh, South Indian's living environment and the sort of area that the library will affect. And a big, a big theme that came through from the co-design is the community were really affected by the 2015 flooding in South and Eden um, not that long ago. And this is the street actually that the library's on. It's a cleaning up. So um, as I said, like there were key initiatives that the co-design group came up with. Uh, there's quite a wide range of them, including makerspace, recording studio, social <coughs> enterprise, cafe, um, a wetland garden, which was an interesting one. So I'll just pick on one of them to show you how we can integrate um, regenerative thinking into our, um, into our designs. So this is what we call the rain garden initiative. So it initially started off as a green roof on top of the building. but um, for uh, foundation reasons and additional seismic weight that we didn't really want, um, it was going to be quite expensive. So, um, so this is where it was good to be involved in the in the co-design process, and um, we got to influence influence the thinking a bit. So the idea was, why don't we take it off the roof and put it and put it on the ground? So, and that that actually made it more accessible to more people, and so. The rain garden uh, is fantastic um, in terms of uh, flood protection as well. So what it does is it soaks in the stormwater off the roof 
and that gets filtered through plants. But there's also some stormwater retention before it gets piped into the um, into the stormwater network. So that, that that's going to become like an educational piece too. So there'll be signs around that to to talk about how it works and stuff. And that could be one of the solutions that helps um, get South and Eden um, more resilient in terms of um, future flood protection. And just as, as an example of what they can do to to protect themselves against that. Yeah, and the other, so yeah, I think I've talked about all this, but the, the, the other thing um, regenerative practice likes to do is develop without compromise. So you kind of, you might be, a typical design situation, you're sort of um, trading off different things with the architect. But the idea about regenerative practice is to do something um, that doesn't compromise all the things you do. So by taking it off the roof, we actually made it more accessible and we saved costs. So it was definitely a win-win. So, so what principles did that apply to? So working in holes, not parts. It was a whole design team collaboration. So we had the civil guys, architects, ourselves and the co-design all um, integrally involved in that. And so this is a good one for nature as well. So we're trying to replicate the systems of nature where we're previously the site's 100% impervious with asphalt and roofs. Now we're sort of trying to soak in some of that, <coughs> soak in some of that rainwater. And we're taking a problem flooding and turning it into potential, which is learning. So the learning that we can achieve could be um, very powerful. So in summary, uh, I found from the co-design that the community really values resilience. I think that's best uh, characterised by one one of the members who told me that um, he'd obviously been through the floods and he said, um, Simon, if I win a lot, I'm going to raise my house. And I thought, wow, that's that's an amazing, really. So I think, like, I, th I thought to myself, if he won a lot, why wouldn't he move out? But it just it told me about how much he loved South and Eden. And... Um, yeah, and also the fact that he's actually in a wheelchair as well, so raising the house would mean difficulties of him in terms of um, access, but he really valued that resilience of having a, a higher house that would um, would uh, would prevent the flooding. So we, we talked briefly about earthquake uh, resilience as well, and I guess like a lot of the community uh, know people in Christchurch. It's only been 10 years, so um, they were quite keen to do, do some... Um, provide some resilience in that, which we'll get into shortly. Um, it did elongate the concept phase, as I mentioned, we went online during COVID and um, the whole consultation um, on steroids basically did push things out. But it also meant the client was really committed to it. Like they'd made promise, they'd been through this whole co-design and then we got to the point where the budget was a bit more than what they wanted and, but they had to front up with the money really because they didn't want to back down after they'd done the, been through this process. And it sort of it highlighted the importance of this project. Like the community really needs this for multiple reasons. So into the structure a bit. Um, so the site is uh, characterised by 20 metres of very soft soil. The existing buildings are settling quite a lot. And we did some consolidation tests and uh, some settlement analysis. The geotechs were giving us 150 mil of settlement from uh, 10 kPa. But luckily there was minimal liquefaction risk. So those settlement figures, you might think instantly, let's pile. And we kind of we definitely went there. But the QA said to me, Simon, you can either have piles or a building. You can't have both. So here we are. So um, the soil remembers, as my geotech colleagues tell me. So what we've got now is a two-story concrete frame and URM buildings that are quite heavy. And we're replacing it with a lightweight structure. Um, but we, those loads are at different points, so what we're going to do is spread those, spread our new loads out to those points with our raft, which will hopefully help us with any irregular rebound as well. And by not, by not ripping up the existing slab, we're also um, getting another structural layer that we can use to spread the load as well. So yeah, so as I said, like ground being grillage, we're using polystyrene to reduce the weight, and the buildings have been there, I think it's actually 70 to 100 years. Um, but just to confirm they've stopped, we're doing settlement monitoring as well, the existing columns. So this is, um, this is an example of something they call in regenerative practice of tunnelling through the cost barrier. 
So, as you can see on the graph, you can make improvements when we're optimizing our piling foundations, but the real step change in behavior comes from switching to um, a lightweight raft. And how do we do that? I guess we've driven down the weight of the structure so that we can, we can get away from the piles. The architect's really keen on some precast panels. We said, sorry, fire engineer wanted some block work for fire eating. We've had to come up with a lightweight solution. Um, all that, yeah, and that's, that's allowed us to make a massive saving in terms of foundations. The other thing we've done is, um, the, and the Ralph Foundation allows, is some column flexibility. So the frames, they're not, actually, uh, they're not actually part of the lateral system, and they can't span the whole way either, so we've got props in there to, um, to break that up. But the beauty of it is we can shift those props, and this is a good regenerative initiative because it allows the facility to change and evolve over time. Um, so future alterations are more easily enabled. So to do that, as I mentioned, we've got a separate lateral system. Um, yeah, so you can see the crosses, which are the SHS um, columns, and they can be moved along the foundation lines. And another piece that fits well with regenerative practice is um, solar panels. So they obviously create electricity um, over time. And so the simple thing was just to allow for a little bit more weight, and that was... Um, took care of that from a structural perspective. Um, they're not actually going to install these straight away. They're going to wait till 2030. The, carb the council has a carbon zero 2030 goal, so this fits nicely with that. And also hopefully allows technology to evolve in the solar panels so we can get a better system up there. Yeah, so briefly on resilience, we talked about the flood protection and sort of raising the slab to get that. Um, in terms of seismic resilience, we've kept it pretty simple, effectively by just um, lengthening the serviceability period. So we've got a low ductility structure, miracles 1.25, um, ply shear walls, and um, we've capacity designed them so they'll have it basically, effectively, they could be ductile if we need them. But um, it's also a relatively stiff system, so I think that's really important when it comes to resilience. It's not just about the structure, it's about protecting everything else. Um, the other thing too is we're looking for quality material selection. So I think it was talked about yesterday about how the 50 year design life is pretty arbitrary and ideally we want this building to last for longer than that. Um, I'll never forget when I was a graduate going to an opening of a, of a building that we'd designed and um, the owner stood up and said, oh this building's going to last for 100 years. And I thought, oh, hang on a sec, we've only designed it for 50. So, um, yeah. So what, what have I learned about this? Um, so regenerative design gives us um, the opportunity to collaborate with other disciplines. So it's hard, it's hard for us as structural engineers on our own to influence a lot of these things, but we can, um, by helping others um, with like just little things like a little bit more weight for those solar panels or um, the foundation design or the column flexibility, we can enable other things to happen. Now, I found it really awesome um, to be involved up front, to understand the why of the structure, why it's so important to the community and, um, and why things are done, I think. Often sometimes we come in late in the piece in the project and we're, we're playing catch up, why do we do this, why is that design decision being made. Um, but you're yeah, getting everyone on board in the team environment is really fantastic. And I think structural engineers have got a lot, lot of value to add in this space as well. So we can help with like bigger picture decisions, um, and it's um, yeah, it's different. It's a mindset rather than a prescribed system. So initially, when we started this training, um, we did like an eight-week course with the Clear Institute in parallel with the project, and I found it quite challenging. But the um, the the lead said to me, um, Simon, if you're feeling challenged, that actually means you're open to more learning. So okay, that's yeah. Fair cool. So after that, I found it a little bit easier because um, this is something that's definitely not um, ETABS or uh, Excel. Yeah, so that's about all. Did we have any questions?
have you worked on any, I guess, living building projects or anything similar? And how would you compare it? What, what would you recommend? Would you recommend that we go down a regenerative thinking training approach or use a system like the living building? I haven't actually done a living building challenge project, but um, I've been told that you can actually incorporate a living building challenge um, into a regenerative design. Yeah. Thank you, Simon. It's starting to speak like an architect, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, being a lead consultant on a job like this, what are the challenges you find? Challenges, um, getting the architect to deliver on time. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting when the shoe's on the other foot, isn't it? But um, yeah, I, yeah, um, it is like, I guess that's the nature of a, a large company as well. We can't blame the geotech engineer, they're on our team. Um, can't blame the architect, they're our sub consultant. So it's, 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 we're all in one team, and I think that's really good. Um, I've, I've, I've found it really good actually. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. That was a really good speak, talk. Um, you talked about working in holes, not parts, um, and having like lots of people present at the table regularly for meetings and things. Um, how does that actually play out in terms of, um, can, can it be very time consuming and frustrating at times when you kind of you're wanting everyone to be able to hear and have their peace, but at times you want to be getting on with your own individual part of the project. Has that been a challenge? Yeah, no, that, that was definitely a challenge. Um, so in that space, um, what, what you need is a really good facilitator who can drive things and can um, move things on when we need to and put, yeah, get input from the quiet people who won't, won't participate in such a large group session. Um, and the other thing too, we're drawing a line under the co-design, so then we're back into like normal, developed, detailed construction. Mm. Yeah, once we get to, yeah, well that's the point we're at now effectively. Mm. So like a co-design to the concept stage? Yep. yep. Yeah, concept and start a preliminary, yeah. Yep. Last question please. Um, you've um spoken about a process that's obviously really well suited to a public building process. Um, how would you see its applicability to a hard-nosed commercial uh, client's project? Um, really good question, actually. I'm not sure it'll be work, to be honest. Um, what I haven't said is the concept design stage was 10 months, so that's quite a long time. Um, and there were some reasons for that, but um, it really pushes things out. Um, and also there's obviously the additional cost of the consultation. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'll have a think about that. That's a, yeah. Thank you, Simon. Our next presenter is Ashkan Hashimi. Ashkan is a lecturer in structural and earthquake engineering at the University of Auckland and he's also a technical director in structural engineering. He has more than 10 years working experience as a structural engineer and is interested in innovation, low damage design and practice focused research. Please welcome Ashkan. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's still from the last presentation, yeah? Okay. Uh, Thank you everyone for uh, selecting this session. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about low damage mass timber structures with uh, resilient connections. Um, so if we want to go over the outline of the presentation, uh, first I'll describe the connection system and then I'll go over the important performance aspects of the technology. Uh, then we're gonna review the applications it has for timber structures. Then moving on with uh, case studies, which uh, I have two case studies to share today. At the end, just briefly, I'll mention other implementations that was uh, in the past. 
Uh, resilient slip friction joint. Uh, actually, I have been presenting this technology in conferences the last few years. But this year, I noticed a lot of new faces, so I thought maybe I'll add a few more slides at the beginning to describe the technology itself before moving on to the case studies. Uh, essentially, the resilient slip friction joint is a friction damper, friction connection, that instead of uh, conventional uh, sliding plate, it has profiled grooved plates and then uh, semi-compacted discus springs. So the, this unique combination makes it able to provide damping and resilience at the same time. Before we continue, so why self-centering? Well, there are research showing that residual drift ratio, even as little as 0.1%, could mean that uh, structural members should be uh, realigned. So it means that even though the structure could be safe and sound in terms of strength, but because of that, a costly, cumbersome procedure we have to go through to realign the members. And if it's beyond 0.5%, demolishing would be more economical than repairing. And this is based on a study done in Japan after Kobe earthquake. The unique characteristic of this technology can overcome that problem and can provide a self-centering behavior for the system, which is for timber structure has, is very important because for timber structures, it's very hard or almost impossible to generate a restoring force in the system. So it's different from steel and concrete. Uh, with this technology, the clamping bolts are only in tension. So there will be no shear failure in the bolts. And then the cap plates or the black ones wouldn't jump to the next ridge. Um, they're designed that way. And then at the maximum capac design capacity of the device, uh, the discus springs are fully compressed. It can work in tension and compression in a, with the same characteristic. And then everything it remains elastic uh, up to the design strength of the device. So this is the hysteretic behavior of uh, these devices. So the one is the schematic one, and here is the experimental one. So you can see there is a perfectly good uh, agreement with, for, with the experiment and the theoretical prediction. And one important thing with this is that because of the nature of, of the hysteretic behavior, it, it is monitorable very easily because at any given displacement, if you have a way to read the displacement, you can correlate it to a force. And this is also a unique characteristic. So a quick and efficient post-event inspection is possible. And then if you have something like this mechanical gauge to read the delta after the earthquake, you can quickly uh, calculate the force in the structures, the lateral members. In terms of performance, So this is the hysteretic behavior of the system. And this is the maximum strength of, of each device. This is the activation point of the device where the designer can specify this. So usually this is governed by SLS1, SLS2, wind, or any other criteria. And this is tunable. It can go up and down. And also the other two points are also tunable based on the physical characteristic of the device. So in summary, it gives a very good flexibility to the designer to come up with the design to achieve the performance objectives in mind. Um, 
We have been receiving questions about high speed, high cycle performance of the devices. So we have done research and testing to show what will happen in high speed, high cycle. So this test was done uh, two years ago at the University of Auckland Transport Lab where there is a dynamic uh, testing machine. And these are the results. So the one on the top left is the quasi-static or pseudo-dynamic testing results. And here, instead of applying a load protocol, we just applied 25 full cycles. We were just curious to see what will happen if we push it. And uh, the red dashed is the predicted performance. So as you can see, perfectly matching. When we increase the frequency to one hertz, which covers, mo which covers most of the structural applications, at least in New Zealand and similar countries. There was a bit of increase because of the speed. And then when we moved to two hertz, which is a bit not realistic for, for structural applications, we observed about 5% increase. So in general, if we have enough, well, if we have an appropriate overstrength factor, then we can uh, work, work with uh, these devices with confidence. Over a string mechanism, what will happen if um, we, have a lar we have a larger than design level shaking? So the system has a built-in function called the secondary fuse. What does it mean? It means that when the applied load is more than the design load, so, in, so this is the design load of the device then these clamping rods will yield in tension, so not shear, just in tension. And this yielding provides extra resilience, extra displacement capacity for, for the device. And then it can go up to almost two times the design displacement. For example, if you've designed a device for 100 millimeters, it can go to about 200 millimeters which if corresponds to ULS, that one could correspond to MC, but de depends on the importance level and other uh, design aspects of the, of the project. So what does it mean? It means that if a larger than design level earthquake happens, what should be done is to, we need to go inspect and replace the clamping rods, and then the system should be good to go. We've done tests to, to investigate that. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this test, we tested a device uh, designed for this point, about 700 kilonewton and eight millimeter deflection. And then we pushed it further for, to, to activate the secondary fuse. And as you can see, it could go up to 16 millimeter with a slight increase in the resistance. So the idea here is to move from traditional, well, not traditional, but conventional damage ductility that we are all familiar with it, to a damage-free ductility system, which is very important for timber, because in timber, it's not easy to have this nice strain hardening in the system. And then the overstrength factor when, if you want to design with this system, is about 1.35, which is, in timber world, is a very low, almost too good to be true, because usually overstrength factors used for timber systems is two and above. So in, this is another advantage. Another uh, secondary fuse test, uh, as recent as last week. We performed this last week. So this was a 735 kilonewton device designed for 60 millimeter deflection. So this point was the point that we designed the system based on, okay? Well, the designer did it actually. Um, so this part is, is basically the design value of the 
which which uh, you, you, it could be your ULS or it could be something else in your mind. So that the, the question mark here shows that, okay, it could be your ULS, it could be half of your ULS or whatever, it depends on, on, on your design philosophy. Then we continue testing and as you can see, the 60 millimeter deflection provided by the uh, des design level deflection of the device, it could go to 100 and about 100 millimeters without um, any damage, just yielding of the clamping rods. And uh, one may ask, okay, what will happen if we push it further? So it doesn't fail at this point, it can go a bit further before it fails. So it will provide resiliency beyond MC, which probably at that point, something else would have failed in, this, in, the, in the building. For timber structures, there are multiple applications um, for this system, and because it has an inherent restoring mechanism within it, it's very attractive for timber designers. It can be used for walls, uh, LVL or CLT walls. It can be used as hold downs to form a rocking wall system without the need for any post-tensioning cable or any post-tensioning mechanism. Uh, we've tested this a few years back for the first uh, project that was the uh, new Nelson Airport terminal. So we've performed in-plane testing on the left and then out-of-plane testing on the right. And note that for out-of-plane, there is a swivel bearing, spherical bearing at the bottom that provides out-of-plane compatibility. Something that some engineers usually forget about it. So we need to think 3D when, if we are aiming for a low damage system. Uh, timber braces, so we don't see many types of resilient timber braces. When, when we, we are talking about low damage resilient timber systems, we have seen many cases that the superstra, the floors and columns are, and beams are made of timber, but then there's, there are BRBs there. So one of the few systems that can provide a timber brace, a resilient timber brace, is this one. So for this one, there are devices attached to the end of the brace. So usually this is the glue lamp used for the brace body. And there are telescopic tubes uh, at the center to provide uh, resistance against buckling. So concept inspired by BRBs, but a bit, dif a bit different. Um, this one was also tested at uh, Auckland University of Technology for the Hot Valley Health Hub project. And you can see the video of testing. Uh, repeatable, nice, stable performance. Excuse me. Okay, now let's move on to the case study. So the two case studies I'm going to present today are from overseas, uh, Canada, Vancouver, Canada, that this solution was used for those projects. So firstly is the Fast Anip head office building. Um, this is a CLT building, building cross laminated timber building CLT floors and CLT walls, and uh, some, uh, some columns as well. Um, so Fast Up is a company well known for its uh, uh, specialty in uh, timber design, and they wanted to design a, uh, so in Canada they call it damage avoidance, damage avoidance uh, uh, headquarter for, for themselves which in, it, it's the offices there, they also have a research lab there. So the concept they used was uh, CLT walls. So they used uh, continuous balloon type CLT walls and then the RSFJ units at the bottom 
as hold downs and as some sort of shear key mechanism. Um, for this one, the range, the, the capacity of the devices was in the range of, um, <coughs> excuse me, 700 Q Newton and 15 millimeter displacement. And then these were connected to, to the CLT using knife plates and dowels. This connection was capacity designed to uh, 2,000 kilonewton almost, to make sure that all the ductility comes from the devices. Uh, detailing use for um, knife plates used and dowels. Unfortunately, we wouldn't see much of these connections in New Zealand, uh, probably mostly because when you're designing something like this, it's not, it's not just designing the fastener, all the brittle failure modes of the timber connection should be calculated and, and catered for. So I hope we can see more like this in New Zealand soon. Uh, in terms of analysis and design, uh, ETABs, a nonlinear static analysis in ETABs was used to design the global performance of the system and RFEM software was used to design the CLT. <coughs> What they achieved was the RD factor of two, which RD factor is sort of equivalent to our KMU, and then RO factor of 1.7, which is equivalent to SP of 0.6. Uh, so what is important and interesting is that they have different SPs for different systems. So that makes me wondering why we have one SP for all of our systems. Uh, separate discussion. Um, devices were performance tested to make sure that uh, everything is beautiful to be installed and used, and then shipped to Vancouver. So the way they erect it, they put it like this on the ground, and then they put the CLT wall in place, bolted, and easy and fast. And as, as I mentioned, swivel bearings would be used to provide out of flame compatibility for the core. This was a core. Um, yeah, more photos from, from, the, from the system. This was some sort of shear key um, and the dowel connection that we discussed. Uh, the next one is the key drive building. Vancouver, Canada, in terms of size, it's a bit different from the previous one. Um, I added this slide just today because I had received this question during the conference that is there, uh, is, is Canada earthquake prone? So I'm just comparing the hazard, uh, Vancouver, from our current Christchurch and Wellington. You can see that for most of the periods about 0.5 seconds, it's more demanding even than our Wellington here. So it's a, it's a very demanding hazard there. Uh, same soil type, but the thing is they're designing uh, for one in 2,500 years. So this building will be a landmark for, for Vancouver, a 10-story old timber building. Architecturally speaking, is is, is a, uh, is a he ha it has a famous architect, and it has a famous architectural form. In terms of uh, structure, in one direction it has timber braces, in the longitudinal direction. In the transfer direction, is a dual system. It has timber braces, and it also has rocking CLT walls. Design approach. A performance-based design approach with nonlinear time history analysis was performed by Fastenab. So Fastenab, they had their head office first, and then they used the technology for their most important project. It was deemed as a special project, so it went through a special uh, path for design. And a New Zealand solution was used this is the tallest old timber building in a seismically active region. The design process was collaborative between four parties, Tectonis, the New Zealand party, 
FastNet and the two peer reviewers. So it has, it has, it had, it has, still has two peer reviewers. One peer reviewer, Osenko, dedicated to, to, for the analysis, earthquake records, scaling, time history results, damping model, method of analysis, and so on and so forth. The second peer reviewer, RJC, was dedicated for design, <coughs> detailing, and performance. So Osenko and RJC are, they have same tier as WSP in Canada, which is the, I think is the largest in Canada. So all important companies. How they did the design, they picked 15 records and scaled it. Out of those 15, they picked five worst ones and they averaged the five worst. This is totally different with, from what we're doing in New Zealand. Again, separate discussion. Uh, they kept the interstory drifts under 1% to achieve the damage avoidance performance they want. They achieved the uh, RD factor of three, a fully self-centering behavior. They've also performed MC analysis and made the conclusion that the overstring mechanism is adequate for MC. Detailing used for uh, braces, same, similar, similar to the head office. Uh, knife plates with double type fasteners. For the walls, they use an interesting system. Um, they use hold downs. They use the pin at the middle to make it a rotating wall instead of a rocking wall to take care of the wall to floor displacement incompatibility. They also had perforated place to yield and make it a dual, dual resilient system. Um, I'm about to finish, just a few quick slides about other implementations. Nelson Airport Terminal, that was the first timber building that the technology was adopted. Hot Valley Health Hub in Wellington, uh, timber braces. This one I added just half an hour ago. This one won the award last night, but one piece that was missing last night was during the dinner was that this all timber building uh, and WSP did a great job making the concept work. We're using RSFJ units to provide the low damage performance. And these devices are used at the bottoms of all CLT walls. Um, and I have some conclusions here. I'm not going to go over them. Um, maybe it's better to have time for questions. Thank you. Our third speaker will be known well to many of you. Jeff Bird has been an active member of CSOC, serving on the management committee since 1994. He's currently responsible for the CSOC design software, including CSOC Soils, Gen Coal, MemDes, and more recently the development, development of MemDes Plus and the latest edition, GenWall. Jeff was the original developer of MemDes in about 1998, and a year later the initiator and co-author of the CSOC Simplified Steel Design Guide. More recently, two CSOC design guides have been some years in the making, the timber pole retaining walls and the reinforced concrete cantilever retaining walls design guides are substantially complete, with these to be the underpinning technical basis for a revamped CSOC soils module. Jeff is an associate structural engineer with Becker, involved in national technical development initiatives. His career over some 40 years has included a variety of roles in construction, consulting and the steel industry. Please welcome Jeff Bird. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to the CSOC software update. Uh, and just uh, before commencing, I'd like to pay a couple of credits. First of all, to Becca for their generosity in my time involved um, with CSOC activities. It is not insignificant. Uh, and also to the person on the right there, 
Ellen McPherson, um, who, for those that have used the um, software support line, uh, Alan's very responsive. He started off doing the maintenance uh, side of things with the software, um, and then it, all the new developments, the Memdes Plus, the Genwall, et cetera, um, have been Alan's work overseen by me, and so on. So what do I want to talk about today? And I've probably set myself up for a failure a little bit, trying to bite off too much um, in one session, but I'll try and move fairly quickly through. So I want to talk about Genwall, just very briefly. That's a reinforced concrete shear wall design program. The soils retaining wall design guides that are substantially complete. And if there's time, I may just very briefly cover MEMDES 4. So first of all, a little trip down memory lane, and this was sort of a little bit of a light bulb moment for me um, a few days ago. Um, so some of these earlier dates are a bit approximate, but 1998, CSOC soils. 2004, beam days. 2007, basic beam days. Gencol, 2014. MEMDES, which I originally wrote um, when I was at New Zealand Steel slash Steltec, uh, we brought under the CSOC banner 2017. 2019, MEMDES Plus. 2020, Genwall. Uh, and around this time, we um, took off BEAMDES. Uh, it was a fully um, ductile moment, for capacity moment frame design program, quite complex and relatively little use. So we have not supported that. 2021, um, bridge beam, relatively specialist software. This is something that was written by HERA many years ago, um, and I realised this was kind of um, got left behind, was only working in DOS, so we brought that through to a Windows environment, and that's finally been verified and put up on the website. MEMDES 4 is due within weeks, uh, and 2022, an update to the CSOC soils uh, program for the two retaining wall modules, which um, I will cover shortly. Uh, just in terms of the software, um, Jason Ingham, past president, has been bugging me for about three years to do a software seminar. So that is now planned for September, October. We'll be covering uh, basically all the CSOC software. Um, just in terms of the big picture, um, quite a bit on the slide, but perhaps two messages. So in the software, when I took over the software portfolio a little over 10 years ago, I wanted to track how much the software was being used because I go to the management committee quite frequently for dollars and they're not just low dollars. Um, so we see here, this is the growth year on year. So this is a count of monthly usages. So whether a person uses it one or a hundred or a thousand times in a month, there's one count, a phone home no identifying information about the project, the designs. We're just tracking how much each of those programs are being used. That's in total. And here's the different programs. Uh, and again, we're seeing every time, uh, quarter on quarter, because I report this to the Mancom. We have four meetings a year. It's just going up every, every time. A little bit of background. <clears throat> Moving on to Genwall, so why did we write Genwall? Um, ETABs and various other programs do particularly flexural design, some might do shear. But I was not aware of any software commercially um, or even within companies, a decently written software that would do the confinement, the ductility, and all that kind of provisions are uh, 23101. So let's do a decent tool for everyone to use. Um, 
A couple of things. It is a sectional based program, so you might have to do multiple load cases, multiple levels, but it's quite a powerful tool. The section must be doubly symmetric, so we do re rectangular, rectangular with enlarged ends and also flanged ends. User interface tried to get something that was simple yet intuitive covering the vast majority of situations, but not trying to be all things to all people, um, with indicative graphics and versatility. So a couple of, in fact, four screenshots. This one is on the re reinforcement page and with a, an enlarged end wall. And we can see here, this panel is for the vertical reinforcement. Uh, and relatively few boxes, as few as we could get, uh, which is defining the reinforcing in the web and in the ends. And here's the horizontal reinforcement. And you can say every pair, every two, three, or four pairs, and so on. A similar view, but again, with uh, this time with a flanged wall and slightly different input parameters. We're looking at the first of the output screens here. Um, and this is what we've called results. So this is the summary and the green check boxes of all the key points to um, be checked. Uh, and this panel at the bottom is particularly showing the compression zone um, A and C on the end there. <coughs> Moving on to the output tab, which is also um, results, but this is showing the detailed calculations, and just like any software I'm involved with, Memdes, Memdes Plus, et cetera, uh, people have come to expect, uh, I don't like black boxes. So basically every calculation that's doing there, it is all there. The, the equations, the references, the details. And in the bottom we have the strain diagram uh, and the net force components. So there's a few challenges with the implementation of that. Uh, I probably won't spend too much time covering on those, uh, but we have tried to do something that's reasonably flexible, but simple to use. When you get into developing software, there's various things that you actually have to nail down uh, in detail. And I've just highlighted a couple of these here. When you're doing axial load design, so we have the balanced curve approach. Do we include phi in the axial load? 3101 is not particularly clear on that, and it depends whether you're below or above how it affects your result. So on this and a number of other things, we actually went to Des Ball and Professor Richard Fennick, who was very generous with his time, uh, and yes, phi is included in that calculation. Axial load, this is for a singly reinforced rectangular wall, 1.5% phi F, AG F prime C. Was that a mistake? No, it's actually correct. <laughs> um, so there's various things. Moving on to the retaining walls design guides. Um, so, as I mentioned, it was a little over 10 years that I inherited the software portfolio from Easley Forest, who had written both the Soils program uh, and the two Beam Deers programs. He had had a lot of liaison with Mick Pender. Uh, so what's the technical basis? B1 VM4. But as most of you know, B1 VM4 is a fairly light document and, and there's certain assumptions and limitations and lots of gaps. Easley, unfortunately, didn't record a lot of those conversations with Mick, but even if he had, what's our technical basis? So it's a real challenge for us. Um, and I started looking at other standards, AS4678 from Australia, um, and also the Euro code. No, I'll back up one. I took out a couple of slides last night to try and improve my uh, timing. Um, so one of the challenges between these different documents in B1 VM4, there's six limit states, and they all look good. 
The Euro code has a heap of them, and 4678 from memory has four, and they all seem to make sense when you look at the document on their own. Yet they're all fundamentally different. And then we look at design examples, for example, the MB module six, which is one example of a cantilever pole and one example of a reinforced concrete wall. Of course, it's only one soil type, one set of geometry. They may or may not include seismic. None of them include water. Um, at one stage, NZGS were talking about doing a New Zealand version of AS4678, um, but that has not yet seen the light of day. So several years ago, uh, probably somewhat naively, I put my hand up to write a design guide for these to New Zealand conditions. So that's where we're at now. The two guides are one on cantilever timber pole, uh, which is around 37 pages and counting, and the concrete cantilever, uh, which is 46 pages and counting. Each time we go through an iteration, it seems to be we're having to add more detail in, even though we're trying to keep it simple. The basis is retaining wall design for structural engineers. I'd hate to say retaining wall design for dummies. Let's call it retaining wall design 101. So what I've really sought to do, uh, and if we just look through here, um, just starting at the high level design basis, assumptions and limitations, failure modes, soil mechanics, and so on. So starting off at a high level and just gradually immersing the reader in the detail and what he needs to know until we get down to all the details of the load and resistance components in the calculation process. And we'll just look at a little bit of that. So it's written by structural engineers for structural engineers. But clearly we had to have geotech input. Um, and I'm indebted to Becker. I've bugged a number of my colleagues at times, but especially John Wood, um, who has been very generous with his time um, John is a retired engineer, but he's still actively uh, working in some of the space, and his name will come up later. So John has been instrumental in helping us to put this together, and certainly to the calibre it is at, at the moment. We've, within Geotech, there's a um, difference between some do factor of safety, some do load factor design. Structurally, we want to do the factor of safety, uh, the load factor design, but I've written it so that you can also do factor of safety. Um, and cover all the soil types, gravity, seismic, water table, and uh, water including, dare I say it, hydrodynamic effects um, recently. Getting a bit too detailed from my liking, but it's one of those things that you've got to do. Uh, fundamental assumptions, a few things in there. Uh, in terms of the soils and geotech, maximum of three metres height. We want the structural engineer to be able to do a simple cantilever structure. If you want to tie it back, et cetera, et cetera, get a geotech involved. Uh, not displacement sensitive, uh, certain spacing limitations for the cantilever pole and so on. Just in terms of this diagram, for those that are familiar with the MB module six, you'll recognise this one. We are doing sliding, we are doing rotational failure, we are not doing global slope stability, and we're barely touching the structural. If you're a structural engineer, I hope you can design a reinforced concrete wall and a timber pole. If not, uh, perhaps look at something else. Um, just high level a little bit more, categorization of soil types. Um, it's not good enough just to know cohesive or cohesion-less. It depends on your loading. So for static and for dynamic, i.e. seismic, we handle the soils differently, particularly with cohesive. So we can see here for, so we, we use this term drained and undrained. So if we have cohesive, long-term we're treating it as drained, i.e. cohesionless, uh, short-term undrained. The other one, so we completed the cantilever timber pole about 18 months ago, and that had been through an NZGS review process. So then I started looking at um, 
various design examples, Mick Pender's 2000 notes, the MB example, anything else I could get my hands on. And getting a range of response, a range of outputs, particularly in terms of the load factor, the factor of safety design and so on. So John Wood um, took this on board and he researched a whole bunch of uh, approaches, standards, outcomes, and we have come up with a CSOC recommended set of load factors and strength reduction factors for both documents. A couple of slides for each. Cantilever timber pole, what approach are we taking in terms of the pole design? Are we using continuous wall? Are we using broms or whatever? So we're using this approach here where the load spread, and I'm talking about below ground level, of course we have 100% width above there. Below ground we're taking up to 4D, and beyond that we're using a reduced effective pressure width. And this is the soil mechanics where um, load blocks one, two, three, and four are all the active load blocks, and five and six are the passive, and we have the blue for the water and so on. Reinforced concrete cantilever. Uh, we're using a virtual back of the wall approach. Um, and of course, your surcharge load and your soil loads and water. Um, and then, you know, whether it has a, a key. Whoops, wrong way, sorry. Uh, so for, for sliding, do we have a key or not? Uh, and we've managed to come up with a formulation that takes the advantage of a key being near the back versus the front. It does affect performance for cohesion, for cohesion less, I think. Um, and for flexure, for, for overturning, we have our various weights. And of course, we have the soil to soil friction um, at that virtual back of wall. Um, so there's been lots of challenges in there. If you have a very narrow heel at the back, what can you can you still take the virtual back of wall? We've had to deal with those kind of things. So that is now with NZGS for review. Um, it is my intention to present the cantilever timber pole, even if it's still in draft, at that September October uh, seminar series. So um, since I've got three minutes left, I'm just going to take one minute to very quickly. Uh, mentioned Memdes V4, that is effectively complete. We are nearly complete with the verification. All these new softwares, we have done a serious verification program, um, typically with top PhDs out of University of Auckland and spending not a few hours, days and weeks. Um, so Memdes V4, so what's that about? To date, you could only do locked in library sections. Uh, and this was something that was asked of me early on. Can we do take a grade 300 section and turn it into a grade 200 historical section or not? what? Um, no, we couldn't, but we're now opening up that capability. So this screen is showing a library section and you can change basically any property of that, however you want, whether it's yield. Um, section properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and save that and use that. And similarly for a welded beam, separating from the New Zealand steel Steltec type section, that, that now can be used pretty much with any international steel availability, imported steel, big projects, New Zealand International Convention Centre, et cetera. So that's just a very, very quick intro to that. Uh, Memdes V4 should be out in the next few weeks. Um, and in parallel, we are updating, there's a number of amendments, the 3504, which haven't been put in there, that'll be V4.1 in a little bit. Thank you, and questions? <laughs> Sorry, I will make one comment that I didn't mention. Um, we're designing these tools so they can be used in batch mode, automated mode. So you can create data sets, uh, so it's not just an interactive tool. I actually did this with Memdes before I left New Zealand Steel. They broke it within a few years of me leaving it, but it's back in there. So it's not only an interactive tool, you can actually use it in batch mode for automated processing too.